I'm not even aware when, how far down the hill do you got to go to get power? How far down in the, the hill do you got to go to get signal and make a phone call? Tonight on the ABC 10 News at 6, outrage as families across the area prepare for blackout conditions. When it's all said and done, millions of people could find themselves in the dark for days on end. It was unnecessary. They're in bankruptcy because of their terrible management going back decades. A plan shut off this big has never happened before. Stores are already running out of water and ice. PG&E blaming dangerous fire conditions. The most extreme fire danger headed our wake. Peak winds hit overnight. ABC 10's live team coverage starts right now. Good evening, I'm Chris Thomas. Thanks for joining us. We have team coverage tonight on the major PG&E power shutoffs and dangerous fire conditions impacting millions of people. We are live all across Northern California. Classes are canceled. Businesses are now shut down. Lena Howland is in Vacaville because listen to this, half of the city is now in the dark. Kurt Rivera is in Winters. Daniela Pardo is in Rio Vista tracking a fire that has shut down several roads. Mady Gomez is in Placerville and Kevin John is in El Dorado County following major traffic issues in Cameron Park. We are also waiting for a news conference with PG&E in San Francisco tonight. We'll take you there live as soon as it starts. But first, breaking news tonight. ABC 10's Daniela Pardo is on the scene of a fire in Rio Vista. Tell us exactly where you are, Daniela, and what is the latest there? We're on Bird's Landing Road, which is this road right here. Behind me is where Highway 113 is. And so much progress has been made in the last 45 minutes that we've been here. Chris, when we first came to you live at the end of our 5 p.m. newscast, you couldn't even see these windmills. They were just covered in smoke. But over the last 30, 45 minutes, fire crews have made a lot of progress. When I spoke to the fire chief on my way here, he said it, the fire was about 30% contained. But at this point, we're not seeing any any more flames. We're just seeing firefighters put out several of those hotspots and we are waiting for a spokesperson with the Montezuma Fire Protection District to get here to give us the latest information on this fire in Solano County. But I can tell you that there are several different fire departments from Benicia, Fairfield, Vacaville out here and the Solano County of Emergency Services is also out here. So again, we're just waiting for a public information officer to get here to give us more information as far as when the roads are gonna open. But we also know, or just from what I'm seeing right here, I'm not seeing any homes at risk. Um, we will be sure to bring you an update as soon as we get more information, Chris. And Yala Pardo live tonight. We'll come back to you as things merits, but let's get over to PG&E now, giving us a live update on these power outages. These for your patience. Second, we would like to remind our customers and our community members as to why we are making this decision. And this decision is all about public safety, which is our most important responsibility. Given the forecasts for the severe and widespread wind conditions that Scott will discuss, and the increased fire risk associated with these conditions, we took this step to ensure the safety of our customers and our communities as a last resort. And we're committed to reducing the risk of catastrophic wildfire events. I would also like to reiterate, as we discussed last night, that the Public Safety Power Shutoff Program is part of our comprehensive, multifaceted approach to risk reduction measures that we are implementing as it pertains to the unprecedented wildfire risk that our state is facing. We are fundamentally redesigning and hardening our system that we discussed yesterday in terms of targeted undergrounding, significant increase in clearing vegetation and trees in and around our overhead assets, conducting enhanced inspections with the best available technology using drones with high resolution imagery. We have a 24-7 wildfire safety operations center that is fully staffed 
We have implemented weather stations, high definition cameras, and all of this is providing us the situational awareness and the intelligence in regards to the weather forecasts and the subsequent risk that our com communities are facing in regards to potential wildfires. With that, I'm going to request our principal meteorologist, Scott Strenfeld, to come up and provide an update in regards to what we're seeing with the weather forecast. Scott? Yeah, thank you, Smith. Scott Strenfeld, PG&E Meteorology. So essentially, meteorology continues to track and has been tracking over the last week a what we call a Diablo uh, windstorm. Essentially, we're going to have a weather system that's going to be an inside slider, a classic setup for uh, what we know as Diablo uh, winds across Northern California. And then as that system moves south, uh, Friday, Thursday into Friday, it's actually going to produce some Santa Ana winds across Southern California, including portions of our territory, the Tehachapi Mountains. And so so this is a total California-wide fire weather event. Um, essentially, there's going to be multiple phases of this event that meteorology continues to track. The first phase occurred today. We had north winds going down the Sacramento Valley, as well as some of our adjacent terrain on, on the either side of the valley. Uh, we saw redding, uh, portions of redding up in that area hit gusts of 50 miles per hour. And uh, one thing I just wanted to go back and say about these uh, Diablo and Santa Ana wind events is that these events historically are the events that cause the most destructive wildfires in California history. And so we're seeing some of the same conditions that are going to develop in this event that we've seen in previous offshore Diablo and Santa Ana wind events. So it's a, it's a pretty serious um, situation. Meteorology continues to um, coordinate with our agency partners. Every day we are joining an interagency call with the National Weather Service and the uh, Northern Operations Predictive Services. And essentially the meteorologists and forecast agencies are aligned that this w is a high risk event. Um, if, you, if you don't know, there's national, uh, the National Weather Service has issued widespread red flag warnings across most of Northern California. And those red flag warnings are also in effect for the Tehachapi Mountains and as well as, as well as as well as Southern California. And what I'm showing on the screen here is that our uh, predictive services, uh, Northern Operations, also has this as a as a high risk event and is and is indicating that there is a high risk of significant fires. And PG&E Meteorology is is looking at similar conditions as well. Um, we expect the weather event in totality to subside on Friday as it starts to get out of the uh, south half of our territory and then at that time we'll be monitoring our more than 600 weather stations uh, to give the all clear to our crews to patrol every inch of our assets to determine if there's damage or not so we can re-energize. Um, so that's it in a nutshell and I'll turn it back to Samid. Thank you Scott. <coughs> So let's move uh, now to a situational update uh, in regards to the uh, operational actions that we've been taking uh, as a result of uh, this potential risk that Scott talked about. The first phase of our de-energization uh, was completed this morning. About 500,000 of our customers in the Sierra foothills and the North Bay area uh, experienced a de-energization between midnight and 4 a.m. But we have also identified in the interest of public safety to minimize the impact and disruption to our customers, we have identified limited areas where we could safely energize sections by reconfiguring our electrical system because that part of our circuit and our system was not in a high fire threat area. And as a result, we've been able to bring service back to approximately 44,000 of the 500,000 customers. Additionally, because the wind gusts have reduced in the northwest portion of the Sierra foothills, we are actively working on determining if we can bring service back to one of our transmission lines that is the primary supply of the Humboldt area. If we're able to perform this work safely this evening, which includes performing safety inspections on our transmission line to assess every inch and determine if there's any potential damage that has occurred, safely repair the damage, we will be able to bring service back to another approximately 60 to 80,000 customers this evening if we're able to do that work safely. 
The second phase of our shutoffs in the Sierra Foothills area started around 3 p.m. and it's ongoing over the next couple of hours. Also, as part of our second phase, we are continuing to monitor weather in the East Bay, South Bay, and Santa Cruz areas, and we will be making a decision about the timing of the deenergization later this evening because what's changed from the discussion we had yesterday is that there's a shift in the timing of the weather pattern. So we may be able to delay the start time of that deenergization. Additionally, there were some questions about the impact to some of our mass transit infrastructure yesterday regarding the Caldecott Tunnel. We were able to provide backup generation, and that's uh, currently in place uh, serving the Caldecott Tunnel, so that should not be impacted as a result of the deinitization. In addition to that, we were also able to mitigate the impact to the Tom Lantos Tunnel in the Half Moon Bay area, because again, we were able to reconfigure the electric supply to that tunnel and mitigate the impact as a result of the deinitization. We have also provided backup generation to uh, two of our BART stations so that we minimize any potential impact to BART service as part of our deinitization process. In total, the second phase of the shutoff impacts approximately 250,000 customers. We anticipate the peak risk to continue through late part of tonight into early morning and forecasts of the weather subsiding around noon tomorrow. Again, keep in mind it's a weather forecast and it could be subject to change. Finally, the third phase that impacts our Kern County, which Scott touched on in regards to the Tehachapi area, the scope of that phase has also been reduced significantly. So yesterday we communicated that 46,000 of our customers may be impacted in Kern County. That number now has been further reduced and the impact that we are currently estimating is down to 4,600 customers. And we are in the process of notifying those specific customers. It's also important to remember, as we shared yesterday, that some of our customers may experience a power shutoff, even though weather conditions in their specific area are not extreme. And the reason this happens is because of the interconnected nature of the electrical system, where the power lines work together to provide electricity across our cities, counties, and regions. And as I've stated in some of my points that we just covered, we are doing the, our level best and have an unwavering focus on minimizing that impact, which is why through switching operations, we're able to still continue to maintain supply uh, to some of our customers. Let's now turn to what's ahead. Once the weather event passes, we can begin performing visual safety inspections of every inch of our impacted distribution and transmission infrastructure. We have 45 helicopters that are ready to fly and begin the visual safety inspections as soon as the adverse weather subsides. Additionally, we have 6,300 on the ground personnel that are qualified and ready to conduct inspections and restoration to our customers. We want our customers to be aware that based on the large number of outages, and the potential unknown in regards to the amount of damage to our system, we only know that as we start the visual safety inspections, it could take several days to fully restore power after the weather passes and the safety inspections can commence. We can only perform the visual safety inspections during daylight hours, and our crews are working as safely and will be working as safely and as quickly as possible to get the power restored. We will continue the ongoing communication and engagement with all of our customers, local agencies, state agencies, cities and counties throughout the process so that everyone has the most up-to-date information. 
For that, I'd like to request our Chief Customer Officer, Lori Giamano, to come up here and share some thoughts and insights on what we are doing to maintain the updates to our customers and our communities. Lori? Thank you, um, first of all, I want to uh, show our sincere appreciation to our customers. The customers have been extremely patient with us as we've been dealing with uh, intermittent outages and late on our website as customers try to find information about our outages. I have good news. We've established a separate website. Um, it's an additional website and an alternate to com. Do you want me to start over? Okay. All right. First of all, I'd like to uh, show our sincerest appreciation to our customers for their patience, uh, certainly during this outage, but um, especially as they've been trying to interact with us via our web pages and get information about our outages and how it's affecting them at their residence. Um, I have good news. Um, we have established a new website that we will be sharing through our social channels after the after this press conference. Um, um, that new website will enable customers to see the maps of where the outages are occurring. They'll be able to put their addresses in, search their addresses. They will also get information about where they can um, meet with us at our customer resource centers. So again, we have a new website that we're standing up. We will have that website in effect through the duration of this event, and that will be the source of information for customers to check on outages in their area, their community, as well as see um, additional information about their specific home and location. As I mentioned on the channel, we are also going to post information about our customer resource centers. We have 28 customer resource centers stood up as of today and operating. They opened up at 8 a.m. We have an additional five that will be opening up tomorrow morning for a total of 33 customer resource centers that will provide water, resources for customers to talk to our employees to get information, as well as restroom facilities, um, cooling, they'll operate as cooling centers or heating centers as necessary, and they'll have the ability to come in and charge their devices. So those will be also posted on this new website. Again, I want to, I want to, you know, be very clear that um, we've experienced intermittent outages. We know it's been very difficult for customers. We've made available our other channels and have prioritized um, those customers if they're calling into our call centers. But we have a new website that will be posted and um, has maximum capacity so our customers will be able to interact with us uh, and receive the information that's most important to them. And uh, I'd like to turn it back over to Keith. All right. Oh, what's the going to wrap up for us? Thank you, Lori. Again, I just want to reiterate our sincere apologies for the impact of not having the pg .com website available. We understand and appreciate the patience of our customers, our communities, and we wanted to thank our media outlet partners because many of you in the room here have been very helpful in being able to provide some of the critical information that our customers were not able to obtain from uh, pg .com. So we thank you for your partnership and the best interest and the continued interest of the safety of our customers and our communities. Uh, one final comment that I would like to address before uh, we take questions. Uh, I want to emphasize that the safety of our employees and our contractors, uh, as well as our customers and communities, is our primary responsibility. Uh, our employees and contractors are working hard to ensure our system continues to operate safely and the power line will be restored quickly after the weather passes. Uh, we realize and understand the impact and the hardship as a result of this decision that we've made, but our request of our community members and our customers uh, is to ensure that uh, our employees and contractors, they have families that live in your communities. They have friends. They are members of your communities. So uh, let's just ensure their safety as well as they're doing this work in the interest of your safety. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Keith and we can get into the Q&A session. So, so 
we're going to take these one at a time. Thanks. Dan, Dan I appreciate that. We're, we need microphones so people on the phone can hear you. I appreciate I, I appreciate I appreciate I appreciate that. We're going to run microphones to each of you. Okay? So I believe this gentleman wanted one. We'll go to you next, Dan. We'll go here first. We're, we have a phone line dialed in. We have a, like 150 people dialed in on the phone line. Um, Jim Carlton with the Wall Street Journal. Hey, Jim. Uh, thanks for the update. Um, I'm interested in the timeline. Uh, you're talking about um, delays in phase two. Uh, City of San Jose was talking about 8 p.m. Uh, can you talk about the latest on that? Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, in terms of the delays, uh, our teams currently in the Emergency Operations Center are continuing to work with our meteorology team uh, in regards to uh, the updates to the forecast. Initially, uh, we were going to uh, proceed with the de-energization at noon today for phase two, uh, but we have seen that the weather pattern has shifted to later uh, this evening, and we will be making that uh, decision here with uh, the next hour or two hours to proceed uh, with that de-energization and we anticipate that we will start that de-energization sequence um, you know, by 8 uh, to 10 p.m. time frame and uh, if we see the weather pattern continue to shift um, you know we will uh, do our level best to minimize that impact to our customers and communities in that area even though we're seeing the weather pattern shift on the start time at the moment we're still uh, anticipating that the uh, weather is going to subside side at noon tomorrow, again, being a forecast, and if that changes to earlier or later, we will provide that update accordingly. Thank you. Now, Dan, thanks for your patience. The governor today said that this is an outrage, that we're paying for years of mismanagement. To the hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be in the dark tonight, what do you say to them who think that they are suffering for your mistakes? I appreciate that question. I appreciate that sentiment. Um, and we share the, the sentiments that have been out there in terms of the impact that this has. Um, now, I can't go and speak into the mistakes of the past. What I can tell you is when we look at the climate and the environment in which our electrical Come assets live, rent, operate, rent. breathe in, it's very dynamic. And that environment has changed drastically over the last several years, given the drought conditions, given the amount of dead dying and deceased trees, given the amount of vegetation uh, that is ripe and ready uh, to be a strong fuel source for a potential wildfire. So the environment that coexists with our electrical assets has completely uh, changed from my perspective and the way that we need to maintain our assets, construct them, that's also changing and we, that's exactly what we are doing as part of this. A follow up, how far have you come along in with the hardening of the wires in the high fire threat areas? Because you had a marker for this year, correct? We did, sir. So we had a target of 150, 150 miles right. and we have completed 100 miles and we are on track to uh, complete uh, our commitment of 150 miles this year. Right, but you have 25,000 miles of wire in high, high fire threat areas and, and your reports say that you're having a hard time finding people to actually do the work and also the materials. What steps are you taking to do that much more quickly? Because clearly that's the key reason you're doing this because you can't trust your own equipment at this point, correct? We're not necessarily saying that we can't trust our equipment. I keep coming back to the fact that it's the coexistence of our equipment with the environment. And the factor of safety that existed in the environment naturally when the electrical systems uh, were compromised does not exist anymore. And that's the factor of safety that we're looking to get from our own infrastructure. So we are actively and we have put an all hands on deck approach to be able to get all qualified personnel available in our service territory. And just this year, we brought in more than 2,000 qualified linemen to do the enhanced inspections, which is unprecedented. We did 18 months of work in a four-month time frame. Um, so we're doing everything we can. We've nearly doubled the amount of vegetation qualified personnel that we have clearing vegetation in and around our electrical overhead system. We have now more than 5,000 individuals focused on that effort. Over the past 10 years, Christian, you're next. Appreciate the question. You got you got three you got three in a row. We'll come we'll, we'll come we'll come back to, we'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. We're going to Christian. Go ahead. Captain KTV Channel Two. 
to. I'm wondering this. if we could talk for just a moment this. about. We, we're also getting a lot of frustrated viewers who are asking if this is going to be their new normal. In other words, I'm sorry. Can you repeat your question? Right. Yeah. We're wondering. If we have. A lot you are listening to a very heated news conference with PG&E. As you hear, there are at least 500,000 customers without power. An additional 250,000 customers will lose power as the second phase of shutoffs is now underway.